Good morning. Good morning. I, was, I was impressed this morning. Good job. Um, it's a good Sunday, right? We're in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Uh, it's a, always a, a blessing to have this opportunity to be uh, in the pulpit. Uh, thank you uh, for just giving me the opportunity, not throwing tomatoes at me. Um, I apologize. It's going to be one of these days. I can already feel it. Um, so if you count the amount of times I like, brushed my hair out of my face, it's going to be a, a big number today. So just have fun. It's not cooperating. Uh, I even tried to like water it down this morning. I'll get a haircut. I promise. I promise. Um, I love the fall. Don't you? Yes. Okay. If you don't love the fall, the door's over here and over here. Uh, I'm kidding. But the fall is so great. There's so many wonderful things, right? I have been making it a priority to like wake up early and go on a walk uh, this week. And I don't sweat. When I do that right now, uh, which is a God, uh, amazing gift of God, um, that I don't sweat because I sweat like standing. I'm going to be sweaty standing up here, uh, so like that's beautiful. Uh, it's football season. Uh, some of our teams are seven and zero, uh, and having college game day come to our uh, stadium here this week. Huh? Oh, I was going to let him go. Don't worry, I had it written down. Don't leave yet. Don't leave yet. <laughs> We're, we got a script here, people. We got a script. Uh, but I was, just wanted to let you know that the Indiana Hoosiers are 7-0. So uh, I am riding on cloud 11. Not cloud 9, cloud 11 today. Uh, good job to you guys. I love the fall, right? Uh, but there are a couple things about the fall that we don't like. We're going to get to that. But now, kids, it's time for you to... Vominos. I was going to do a dramatic, like, running of the bulls kind of thing, but half of them already left. Uh, so kids, get out of here. Junior hires. Uh, we have our junior high, junior church today with Patrick, so you also can get out of here if you want. Uh, it's back in the high school, Sunday school room, I think. I don't know where Patrick is today. Uh, so they're going to go. We're going to pray because I, I don't know about you, but I could use prayer this morning uh, just for my nerves. So let's just pray that God would speak to us and challenge us this morning. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for uh, just the, the fact that you love us. Lord, we pray this morning that um, this sermon are words that you want to be said. Lord, that you would speak through me. That you would use this uh, to challenge us. To convict us, to help us live our lives uh, a little more closely to the way that you would have us live our life. Lord, just uh, be with us this morning. Give us your presence. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the cross. It's in your holy, precious name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Okay, so uh, today we are continuing our series on the Imago Day, the image of God. And to me, there are not many more beautiful concepts in the entire Bible than the Imago Day. I mean, grace is great. I love grace. I love uh, the fact that Jesus dies on the cross for my sins. That's, that's like A1. Uh, but the Imago Day is up there because the Imago Day is just this beautiful identity piece for me in my life. The fact that I have been formed in the image of my creator, that because of him, because of how he's made me, I have been marked out and set apart from the rest of the creation. That I have worth and value simply in the fact that I bear his image. That I don't have to constantly strive and work and labor according to worldly standards to find my worth and value, but I can rest in the fact that I am a specially made creation of my creator and that I have intrinsic worth because his breath fills my lungs. I love the Imago Day. I love the fact that I am the image bearer. And, and Jeff has spent the last two weeks talking about a lot of the blessings and responsibilities of us being 
the Imago Dei, the image of God. But the Imago Dei is also a dual-edged sword. Because if I want to accept all of the blessings and all of the benefits that come with the acknowledgement that I am made in the image of God, that I bear his reflection, that I have worth and value in that fact, I must also accept that the rest of humanity shares those same benefits. That the rest of humanity has been made in his image. That the rest of humanity is made with his breath in their lungs. That the rest of humanity shares in all of the blessings that the Imago Dei receives. And so a lot of preachers put their, their, their big idea at the end. And they build up to, I'm going to put my big idea here at the front so you know exactly where we're going today. If you want to write it down, pull out your bulletin and paper. I know I don't do outlines, and I didn't put it in the slides. You've got to listen carefully. I'm going to say it twice. The Imago Dei exists to destroy man-made walls of division and separation in this world. The Imago Dei exists to destroy man-made walls of division and separation that exist in this world. Today we're talking about our responsibility when we look at the Imago Dei. When we understand that every single person is made in the image of God. And we have a couple responsibilities because of that. I'm just going to lay them out here at the beginning. Right? We are called to love every single person that we meet. And we are called to witness about the grace of God to every single person that we meet. Right? Everyone that we encounter is an image bearer of God, and it doesn't matter if you like them or you don't. They are the image bearers. Red, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in his sight. That's easy for us to say. It's harder for us to say Democrat, Republican, criminal, felon, racist, homosexual, transgendered, Muslim, Hindu, Catholic, Protestant. They are all image bearers of God. They are all people that God has called us to love and God has called us to redeem to him. They are people who he died for to save and they are people that he desires to have a relationship with. That is the responsibility of acknowledging the Imago Dei. And today we're going to look at some scriptures that back this up. I'm not just blowing hot air. I promise you I've prayed about this and I've read my Bible and I believe this with all my heart. And we're going to start off looking at a, not a bad Samaritan, but a good Samaritan. So if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 10. If not, it'll be beautifully up here. I even made sure that you can read it this time by picking the right colors, because I didn't want B to get that. I love you, B. So, you can hopefully see it. It's beautiful. Let's read it, right? Uh, we're going to start in verse 29. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber, Jesus asked them, right? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do 
likewise, right? We love this story. We love to preach on this story, but I don't know if we fully comprehend the context and how controversial of a story this would have been to the people hearing it, right? The Samaritans and the Jews were not on very friendly terms for a variety of reasons. First of all, they had some major religious differences, and that has never caused problems ever in history, right? Uh, religious tension, religious disagreements, definitely never started a single war, definitely never had anyone ever get beat up, no one ever killed, right? Never. <clears throat> no sarcasm. Um, it's, 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 religion is a very big topic, and for these guys, this is a difference primarily on where to worship, right? The Samaritans are Jewish. They believe in Yahweh. They believe in God. But they believe that the holy site of Judaism is not in Jerusalem. It's not the Temple Mount. It's Mount Gerizim, which is in northern Israel. So if that was the only difference, the Samaritans and the Jews have beef, right? But it's not. It's also racial. And that's never caused problems in history, right? Racism has never caused problems. Again, sarcasm, in case your sarcasm detector is broken, right? Samaritans were half-breeds. They were Jewish people who believed, obviously, that the holy site was in the north. But after the kingdom of Israel fell uh, to the Assyrians, they intermarried with Gentiles. Everyone say, ooh, right? Because that's what the Jews would have said, ooh. Right? So these guys are religious, heretical half-breeds in the eyes of the Jews. And yet, Jesus is choosing a Samaritan to be the hero of the story. Imagine the person who you least would love to be helped by. Right? Imagine it's the height of the Vietnam War, and Jesus tells us this story about a Republican and a Democrat who walk by on the left side of the road. But a Viet Cong soldier stops to help. Right? You wouldn't feel very great about that story. 1944, Jesus says an American soldier goes by on the left side of the road. A British soldier goes by on the left side of the road. But a Nazi stops to help. We wouldn't like that. Right? We wouldn't feel warm and fuzzy about that. But Jesus chooses the particular group of people that are going to bother the Jews really listening to this story the most so that they understand that their neighbor is not just people who they like. It's not just people who look like them, believe the same things they believe, and have the same cultural values, etc., but that their neighbor, the person that they are supposed to love as they love themselves, are Samaritans, the enemy. Right? The Imago Dei says that every single person is made in the image of God. And Jesus tells this story in part because when he dies on a cross, he is going to be dying for the Samaritan man in this story just as much as the Jewish man that asks the question. Just as much as he's dying for me and just as much as he's dying for you. Right? The cross is not just for people who look like us, talk like us, believe like us, and have the same societal, moral, cultural, and political views as us. Right? The kingdom of God is for everyone. And we need to remember that as we live our life and as we walk through our daily life. We're going to look at another <coughs> uh, Samaritan story. Because in uh, John chapter 4... Jesus goes and he hangs out with a Samaritan woman, right? Now, uh, he had gone through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Because his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. 
Right? So Jesus is once again ignoring cultural, racial, and religious barriers that the world has erected to stop this conversation. But later on, as we read in the scripture, Jesus also ignores moral and cultural and societal barriers because of this woman's sin and the situation in which she lives her life. Right? Down to verse 16. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. And she says, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands, and the man that you have now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true, right? Jesus is looking at this woman that he really should have no business being around, no business having a conversation with. My parents would not get in a room with this woman. That's a, that was a really good joke that I don't think anyone gets, right? Because Mike Pence is like, I don't want to be in a woman that's not my, in a room with my wife. Okay, yeah, never mind. <laughs> much funnier in my head. Much, much funnier in my head. All right, uh, moving on. What does Jesus see when he looks at this Samaritan? Does he see all the things that divide him and her? Does he see all the reasons why he shouldn't be having a conversation with her? Or does Jesus see her as a reflection of his father? Does Jesus see this woman as someone that in a couple years he's going to go on a cross and die to redeem her sins? Because her father desires to have a relationship with this woman. That's the answer. But that's how Jesus sees this woman. That's how we should look at the world around us. We shouldn't look at all of these walls that we build up in our culture. All of these walls that we build up in our society to keep us separate, to keep us apart. Instead, we should look and see people for how Jesus sees people. Precious. Beloved. His children. Someone who his father so desperately desires to have a relationship with that he would send his own son to die for the sins of the world for. Jesus tells a parable about a shepherd who has a hundred sheep. Right? And one day, one of the sheep gets lost. The other 99 sheep, they're great. They're chilling. They're having fun. Life is good. They're in their sheep clubs and their sheep church, and life is good. But the shepherd, he's like, no. Right? The shepherd leaves the 99 to go and get the one, right? the lost sheep. What's the difference between the 99 sheep and the one? What's the difference? Is that lost sheep any less? A sheep? Is that sheep that's lost any less loved? Is that sheep that's lost any different than the 99 sheep that have been found, that have chosen to remain with the shepherd? The answer is no. It's still a sheep that the shepherd loves, that the shepherd will desperately pursue. In the same way, we are all image bearers. It doesn't matter if we have been found and saved or if we are lost in the wilderness far away from God. Every single one of us is a sheep whom the shepherd loves. Every single one of us is a sheep whom the shepherd will drop everything to go and chase. But why won't we treat people like the shepherd treats people? Why, as Christians, do we have such a hard time living out this Imago Day kind of love? Why as Christians is it just easier for us to just love people that look like us and talk like us, but we don't want to acknowledge people that have differing views in us, differing beliefs in us, differing levels of everything that we can think of. We'd love to build up walls in the church. Now, we don't say that, but look around, people. Our church all looks pretty much the same. And I think if we talked, we'd all believe pretty much the same on a lot of things. Right? This time of year is my favorite. I love the fall. But right now, there's something going on that I hate. I despise. 
It's election season. And let me tell you this. People lose their dang minds during election season. And Christians lose their way. Because a lot of us aren't living like the other side is made in the image of God. I'm not going to use this pulpit to tell you who to vote for. I'm not going to use this pulpit to tell you what policy I believe that Jesus would support because Jesus would just love people. I'm not going to use this pulpit for any political reasons except to tell you this. You, as a Christian, need to remember that Donald Trump, Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, anyone that votes for them is made in the image of God. And that they are worth loving, that they are worth pursuing in the sake of the gospel, and that they are someone whom Jesus died to save. And the way that we talk about the other side, the way that we treat the other side, the way that we look at the other side reflects none of Jesus. I see it all the time. I see it on Facebook. I see it the way we talk, the way we look at people. We are more concerned about politics than we are about people's souls at times. And that is a sin. That's wrong. Our citizenship is, yes, we are American citizens, but we are citizens of heaven first. Your life has been bought at a price. And God, he might care about who our president is, but God won't miss a beat if your guy wins or your gal loses. The kingdom of God doesn't slow down for a second based on what party controls Congress. The kingdom of God doesn't slow down for any of these things. And the mission that God has given you to go and make disciples of all nations is your number one priority as Christians. We love God and we love people. One and two. And in political seasons, in elections, we forget all about that. It's all about winning. It's all about wanting what we think is best. Friends, we can't miss the boat. Don't believe me? Let's look at what Jesus was like. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 8. If you don't realize this, almost every single one of Jesus' disciples desperately desired for Jesus to get political. Right? Jesus is living in an occupied country. Right? The Jews are having the Roman jackboot on their throats and they are all desperately craving for a messiah not to save them from their sins but to deliver them from the romans in fact that's why judas ends up betraying jesus because jesus doesn't get on board with his political views so how does jesus treat a roman centurion the bad guys the other side does he mock them does he question their, their, their morality? Does he question that they're made in the image of God? Does he question that they're worth loving? Does he question that they're worth saving? Let's find out. I, I, I love a choose your own adventure. Let's, let's find out. Right? Matthew chapter 8. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a Roman centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. I, I feel like in today's world we would be like, sweet, someone on the other side is suffering. But Jesus says to him, shall I come and heal him? Centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this. And he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping 
and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done, just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Jesus crosses the aisle, metaphorically, of ancient Judah. He converses with, praises, and heals the servant of the political opposition. In fact, he says that they have more faith than all of the Jews following him. And yet, some of us have a hard time imagining Jesus loving someone on the other side because we think their political beliefs are wrong. Christ died for every single person in this world. He's called us to love every single person in this world. You don't have to agree with them to love them. You don't have to not argue. You, don't, you can argue with them and still love them. But we have to as Christians remember that our first responsibility is to God first and country after. We have to understand that our first responsibility when we encounter someone is to love them like Jesus and then bring them to the foot of the cross so they can meet Jesus. Not win some political debate on Facebook or make yourself feel good because you think you changed their minds. And spoiler alert, you didn't. We have to love the world in the way that Jesus loved the world. He laid down his life for people who were still yet sinners, who were still the enemies of God. Christ died for them. Spoiler alert, that was you too. You were the enemy of God before you were saved. And Christ died for you. We have to remember the Imago Dei. We have to remember that our responsibility is to love people like Jesus and to go and make disciples. Right? Matthew 28 always rings true. Verse 18, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus doesn't care about borders. Jesus doesn't care about nationalities, race, political parties. Jesus cares that every single person is someone who looks like his father and is someone who he died on a cross so that his father can have a relationship with that person once again. We love to build up walls. We love to build up borders. We love to build up all of these things to keep us separate from people that don't look like us or act like us or talk like us or believe like us. But friends, the kingdom of heaven is a party that every single person is invited to. Every single person has an invitation invitation. As Christians, we cannot fall into a game of us versus them. That's Satan's game. That's not the kingdom's game. Right? The kingdom of God says everyone has a ticket. And all you have to do to get in is trust that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Put him on in baptism and pick up your cross and follow him. If you want to change someone's political views, that's fine. You won't. Jesus can. You want to change someone's sin in their life? You can't. Jesus can. You want to change how someone thinks about any issue? You can't. Jesus can. Our job is to love people and to bring them to the foot of the cross to meet Jesus. One last scripture and then we're done. I just want to remind you what heaven is going to look like. In Revelation chapter 7, John sees this vision. It says, After this I looked, and behold, 
a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb. Every tribe, every tongue, every language, every people, every political party, every single thing that you can think of, every man-made wall, every man-made barrier, they are all invited to the kingdom of heaven. And our mission and our responsibility is to love them where they are and bring them to the foot of the cross to meet our Savior.